So um, during the next uh, minutes, uh, I, I think I will be talking about 35 minutes about uh, bone and joint infection caused by multidrug resistant and extremely resistant gram negative bacilli. I will give you some insight on the epidemiology, and then I will propose two um, relatively novel um, regimes for treatment, which we are um, still investigating and making research. I will not be talking a lot on uh, the new antibiotics, such as the new cephalosporins with uh, beta-lactamase inhibitors, mainly because we don't have that much experience for the moment. You know that bone and joint infection always gets a little slower to get the new uh, antibiotics because we need like long um, clinical uh, uh, research with long-term follow-up. So um, yesterday we had a brilliant talk by uh, Professor Sales on um, uh, hematogenous vertebral osteomyelitis. And I, I'm just, uh, I am not going to get uh, too much because uh, I think yesterday was said all. Only the thing that uh, in hematogenous uh, osteomyelitis, we uh, have a rate, quite a constant rate of uh, around 10 to 30% of infections by gram negatives. Bone and joint infection, as you all know, is the kingdom of gram positives. And so um, the role of granulatives negatives is uh, less frequent. But there are some particular scenarios where we have to bear them in mind. And so in hematogenous osteomyelitis, which is quite predictable, we have this more or less constant percentage of infection that, as you can see here, in the case series, it is usually between 10 and 30 percent. And this hasn't changed too much in the last years. We, we probably have the problem of granulative infections when we're talking about uh, orthopedic hardware-related infection. So osteosynthesis, and especially in prosthetic joints. And here, again, um, the main role is for gram positives, for staphylococci, mainly. Uh, but we may have some gram negatives in particular scenarios, uh, depending on the host, and depending on the clinical presentation, and depending on the anatomy. And I will go through this uh, in, the, in the next slides. We don't have that many epidemiological studies, so it is difficult to know with, um, uh, to, be, to be precise on what's happening uh, regarding etiologies and regarding epidemiology in the setting of bone and joint infection, because there are not that many uh, studies. But last year in Spain, uh, Dr. De Benito and collaborators published this important study with, uh, this was a very large study with, as you can see here, more than 2,500 prostate joint infections. And this study addressed the etiologies of these infections over a period of 10 years in uh, a large number of uh, Spanish hospitals. Uh, you can see here in the red line that the gram positives are still the most important microorganisms, but we have in the blue line the gram negatives, and as you can see here, in the last years, um, and I'm pointing here, um, you have a, 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 a trend towards a higher frequency of gram negative infection, and this was significant. So we can say that gram negative infection in the setting of prosthetic joint infection, which could be representative of what happens with other hardware-related infection, accounts around 30%, but in the last years, it has grown up. Um, as I was saying, the um, importance of granulative negative uh, in prosthetic joint infections and other hardware-related infections uh, is largely dependent on the clinical presentation. And we know since many, many years, uh, and here is the work by Sukayama and collaborators, which is a classic, that in um, early post-surgical infections, just yes, after replacement of the prosthesis or the device, we may have a higher frequency of gram-negative infection. And this is more rare in the setting of chronic infection or hematogenous infection. So we may expect gram-negatives in the first weeks or months after replacement of the prosthesis. The other thing which is very important is the host. We know that patients who are elderly and patients who carry a hip prosthesis are at an increased risk of having infection by gram-negative. This is a study we published some years ago comparing patients with a total hip arthroplasty with those with a just a, a half uh, hip arthroplasty, a hemiarthroplasty. You know hemiarthroplasty is the treatment of uh, hip fracture in the elderly. And so we could see that uh, these patients who are more elderly than those with a total hip arthroplasty, and they usually have a fecal or urinary incontinence, and they can get the wound contaminated, they had a higher frequency of gram negatives as you can see here. So the host is also important. So when we are talking about gram negatives in the setting of prostate joint infections, what are we talking about? We are talking mainly about enterobacteria and pseudomonas. And as you can see here, over a period of 10 years in Spain, the two most prevalent gram negatives were pseudomonas aeruginosa and Escherichia coli, then followed by other enterobacteria such as Klebsiella, Enterobacter, or Proteus. But then E. coli and pseudomonas were the most prevalent. And what about multidrug resistance? These are the time trends on multidrug resistance overall during distant years in Spain. 
And as you can see here in the red line, we have an overall increase of resistance over a period of 10 years. But this resistance was due especially to the blue line, which is the, uh, the gram-negative bacilli, whereas the orange line is the gram-positive cocci. So we can conclude that the uh, increase of resistance uh, accounts mainly for gram-negatives. And this was uh, significant. <coughs> So this is a provocative slide. This and the followings are going to be a provocative slides of the meaning of multidrug resistance in the setting of bone and gene infection. When we're talking about multidrug resistance, what are we talking about? Um, there's been an effort, and here we have the paper by Majoracos and collaborators, of standardizing the definition of multidrug resistance. And this is important uh, for the setting of uh, clinical trials and for comparative purposes. But uh, from a clinical point of view, when I go to see my patient, for me, resistance or multi-resistance means uh, the scenario where I cannot use the antibiotic that is going to change the prognosis of my patient. Uh, and in this regard, uh, I think that in bone and gene infection, I don't mind a lot. Well, I mind because uh, on epidemiological purposes, this is important, but it is not very important for me um, how many uh, antibiotics I cannot use. The important one is ciprofloxacin because I know that this is going to change the prognosis. In this same study that I was showing to you, we have witnessed an increase, a significant increase in the ratio of ciprofloxacin resistant gram negative bacilli. And you can see that at the beginning of the period, it was around 10%, and at the end of the period, it has doubled to around 20%. So more and more, we have this scenario, which is quite uncomfortable, of resistance to ciprofloxacin. And why is this important? This is important because the prognosis of patients with a prosthetic unit infection who are resistant to quinolones uh, dramatically changes their prognosis. This is the largest study on prostate infection caused by gram-negative bacilli managed with implant retention. Implant retention means maximal difficulty because we will have to give the best antibiotics that we have. And as you can see here, when we were able to give uh, ciprofloxacin or fluoroquinolones to our patients, the prognosis of curing the infection and retaining the prosthesis was around 75-80%, whereas when we couldn't use ciprofloxacin, the prognosis just fall down to around 40%. So this is, this is a drama for the patient and for the physician. So quinolones are very, very important in the setting of bone and gene infection caused by gram negative bacilli. This is the largest study, but there are some other studies who have confirmed, which have, which have confirmed this, these results. So, and this is important because this, this does not only apply to enterobacteriaceae, but it applies also to pseudomonas aeruginosa. And even if in this table you see no uh, um, statistical significance for ESBL producers, you can see that 100% of ESBL that could be treated with ciprofloxacin were cured. So uh, I guess that ciprofloxacin is just uh, the key antibiotic for gram-negative infection. And in this regard, uh, what happens with the alternatives? I mean, w when I have an infection by E. coli, which is resistant to ciprofloxacin, I just look at the antibiogram and I see, okay, I can use ceftriaxone maybe for four or five weeks, and then I can use uh, cotrimoxazole, which is quite convenient because I can give it orally. Okay, beralactams and cotrimoxazole as the alternatives to ciprofloxacin. But we have seen here that the results are quite poor. So what happens? We know that beralactams uh, do poorly, perform badly in the setting of biofilm. We know that because of uh, previous studies. And what about cotrimoxazole, which is a bactericidal antibiotic, which is quite convenient. I can give it orally. You can see here, and this is a very classical study by the Swiss Skull, Whitmer and collaborators, where they use the guinea pig model. Some of you may be familiarized with this model. This is an animal model where the guinea pig gets uh, this small cylinder. This is a foreign body. It gets under the skin of the animal, and it gets inoculated by whatever microorganisms you want to test. And then you treat the animal, and after the experiment, you count how many bacteria you can recover from the foreign model. And you can see here at the bottom line that animals treated with ciprofloxacin were they all cure 100% of efficacy, whereas animals treated with cotrimoxazole, none of them was cured. So cotrimoxazole is not a good option for uh, biofilm associated infections by gram-negative, at least as first-line therapy. I can continue my treatment after some weeks of another antibiotic, but as first-line therapy, it probably is very, very bad. So I was saying that for me, the definition of multidrug resistance in bone and gene infection is probably ciprofloxacin resistant. And these are the preliminary results of an ongoing study in Europe needed by the Greek group, a multicenter study, just describing um, the outcome of patients with bone and gene infection caused by multidrug resistant and extremely drug resistant gram negative bacilli. You can see here that the representation is quite wide. And you can see here what are the fate of the patients with 
uh, bone engine infections, whether they have an infection by a multi-drug resistant or an extremely drug resistant. They all are resistant to cyprofloxacin, and you can see here that more or less they have the same, uh, more or less they have the same prognosis. Therefore, my point is that once you have, um, one, once you are beyond the resistance to cyprofloxacin, probably the fate is very, very bad, and you have to give the patient another alternative, which is not beta-lactams, which is not cotrimoxazole. So just summarizing uh, this point on epi epidemiology, I, can, I, can, uh, I think that we can say that infection by gram negative bacilli in the setting of bone and joint infection is largely dependent on the type and anatomy of the implant, of the prosthesis in this case, the clinical presentation, the host, and the local epidemiology of the place. Um, we have a serious lack of epidemiological studies, and we have to rely especially in those of prostate joint infection. In this case, we have witnessed a rise in infection by gram negative bacilli, and we have witnessed a rise in infection by multidrug resistant gram negative bacilli, including cyprofloxacin resistant gram negative bacilli. In this regard, I wonder if multidrug resistant gram negative bacilli in the setting of bone and joint infection equals just cyprofloxacin resistance. I understand that this is, this is provocative, but um, I would like to know your opinion on this. And therefore, we need alternatives. So I, I'm going to stop for, for some water. Just. So, given said that about epidemiology, I would like to talk about two molecules um, which lead um, to regimes, uh, which I think are very, very interesting for the setting of bone and joint infection. And these uh, molecules are the um, uh, horse of Troy, because they are gate openers. They, they seem to open the gate for the second antibiotic which is included in the regime. These two molecules that I'm going to talk about are cholestine and r phosphomycin And um, when I was preparing this talk, I realized that uh, here in Brazil, you have uh, polymyxin B uh, for uh, systemic antibiotics. We don't have that in Europe. Uh, I think polymyxin B is quite an interesting molecule because you don't administer the prodrug. You directly administer polymyxin B. So pharmacokinetics are more predictable. But um, I don't have experience with that. Anyway, I think that probably the results of cholestines are probably extrapolable to polymixin B, so it can be interesting to, to think on that. In any way, I start with cholestine. You know all cholestine. Cholestine was a molecule developed in the 40s. It was quite an attractive molecule because it had a wide antibiotic spectrum against gram negative bacilli, including Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but it was progressively abandoned in the 60s, mainly because of toxicity and because of the appearance of uh, new antibiotics with a better profile, such as cephalosporins and uh, aminoglycosides. However, time has passed by, and now we have uh, the scenario of multidrug resistance, and uh, we don't have many antibiotics coming down from the pipeline, so we have had to recover uh, cholestine. And what do we know about cholestine? We know that we don't administer directly cholestine to patients, as I was saying about polymyxin B. In the case of polymyxin E, which is cholestine, we administer the prodrug, which is cholestimitate sodium, CMS, and this is quite an inefficient prodrug because only 30% hydrolysis into cholestine. We have 70% that directly goes to the urine. Um, on the contrary, cholestine, the drug itself, when it's been, uh, when, when, once it appears, it doesn't have a, a renal metabolism. And this leads to uh, very low levels of cholestine uh, in the patient. On the left-hand side, you have the um, time profile, pharmacokinetics of the prodrug, uh, CMS, and on the right-hand side, you have the uh, time profile pharmacokinetics of cholestine. And you can see that there's a wide, inter, um, a wide variability, variability between patients, uh, but the average uh, levels of cholestine that we may expect are around 2, 2.4 milligrams per liter. And this is not very high. As you know, the breakpoints of cholestine, for example, for Pseudomonas aeruginosa, are around 2 milligrams per liter. So we can expect levels just um, targeting the uh, MIC, and cholestine is a concentration-dependent molecule, so um, that's not very good from a PKPD point of view, no? And even if we administer the patients uh, the proposed um, uh, doses, such as a loading dose of 9 million of units, and then followed by 4.5 million uh, every 12 hours, what we can expect according to the mathematical models is to have around 2 milligrams per liter, so we cannot expect very high uh, concentrations. And this is particularly, particularly relevant in the strain of uh, biofilm infections because you know that antibiotics um, do not perform as well as in the case of planktonic infection. And so the MICs of bugs within the biofilm increase. And you have here uh, an animal model uh, showing the MIC of biofilm of an animal model infection of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And you can see that the MIC is around 128 milligrams per liter. So there is no way that cholestine alone is able to get to this concentration within the biofilm, right? 
So this is a problem for colistin. And the second problem is that it is well described that colistin has um, heteroresistance. For those of you who are not um, familiarized with the concept, heteroresistance means that even, in, even if in the laboratory they tell me that the bug is susceptible to colistin, I can expect some subpopulations that are not routinely measured that will be uh, more resistant to colistin. They will have MICs which are higher than that reported in the laboratory. And so, when the population of bacteria is exposed to suboptimal concentrations of the antibiotic, I can select these subpopulations, which are more resistant, and eventually amplify them and lead to treatment failure, right? And this has been described for Acinetobacter baumani, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, so we can expect heteroresistance probably in all the enterobacteriaceae. So, summarizing colistin, which is in many times our last alternative, has uh, important problems. It has an important PK PV problem because we will get suboptimal concentrations of colistin, especially in the setting of biofilm and uh, we can expect the problem of the resistance. In this setting, what the experts say is, okay, if you have to use colistin, please use it at high doses and in combination. So why combination? We can expect synergy for colistin because of two reasons. The first one is particularly interesting in the setting of biofilm-associated infections, which is called by someone the, uh, the subpopulation synergy. The subpopulation synergy is a classic concept in microbiology where the two drugs protect each other. And what um, and the population that one drug is not able to kill, the other drug will kill it, and vice versa. In the setting of biofilm, this is particularly important because colistin has shown to have some targets within the deeper layers of the biofilm, which are quite unique. You know that the biofilm that is developed in the prosthesis is not homogeneous. You have different layers, and in each layer you have uh, different concentrations of oxygen and nutrients. In the deeper layers, the concentration of oxygen and nutrients is very, very, very low. And in the superficial layers, it's low, but not that much. So what antibiotics do usually is to kill the bugs that are within the superficial layers of the biofilm. But colistin is able to kill the bacteria which are in the deeper layers of the biofilm. In this slide, I try to show this. Uh, this is a um, confocal laser microscopy with a uh, dying of um, dead and alive cells. In green, you can see alive cells, alive bacteria, and in red, you will see dead bacteria. And you can see that colistin is able to kill the bacteria which are in the center, in the middle of the biofilm, whereas the second drug, in this case, tobermycin, is able to kill only the cells which are in the superficial layers of the biofilm. So if we administer the two drugs together, we can kill the two things. This is important because there are very few antibiotics that are able to kill the bacteria which are, which are in the deeper layers of the biofilm, only phosphomycin, and we will talk about this. So this is important. The second, the second reason for giving uh, colistin in uh, combination is the, synergistic, uh, the, the mechanistic synergy that we can expect. And this regards directly to the uh, mechanism of action of colistin. Colistin integrates in the membrane of the bacteria, and this is known since the year 69 or before, and is able to increase the uptake of other molecules in the bacteria. And uh, it will increase the uptake of colistin itself, but it will, it will increase the uptake also of the second antibiotic that, that we are using. And this also happens even if the second antibiotic is resistant for the bug. You can recover some activity. So let me show you an example. This is planktonic bacteria, not uh, biofilm bacteria for the moment. This is with a hollow fiber model, so this is in vitro. And you have here a killing time curve. So on the y-axis, you have uh, amount of bacteria in a logarithmic scale. And on the x-axis, you have the time. And you can see how you can get bacteria killed when you give some different regimes of antibiotics. So this experiment, um, which was performed by the Australian group in Melbourne, is performed with a Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which, as you can see here, is resistant to imipenem and is susceptible to colistin. OK, so what happens when we administer imipenem? Nothing happens because it's resistant. So this is logical, right? We don't have a decrease in the count of bacteria. What happens when we administer colistin at 4 milligrams per liter, which is active? You can see here a downfall of the bacteria, which is followed by a regrowth, probably because there is an amplification of the heteroresistant subpopulation I was mentioning before, right? OK, what happens if I administer colistin and suboptimal concentrations of imipenem? For example, 1 milligram per liter or 8 milligram per liter. In this case, you can see the downfall which is more pronounced than before, and you have a regrowth, but not as much as the other. So there is synergy, and it seems that colistin may increase the uptake of imipenem, and then the MIC that I had in the standard laboratory uh, will, not, will not be valid longer. It will be probably less, right? 
okay, we have tried this, uh, so um, killing cures, but with a biofilm model, right? And um, this, this, this is a reactor, a CDC reactor, where, uh, as you can see here, this is integrated in a dynamic model, and this vessel contains liquid where there's growing bacteria, and you can see that in the vessel there's an arm that harbors these small pieces, these coupons, or these small disks, which will be the uh, surface where the biofilm will develop. And then we can treat this uh, vessel, this reactor, with antibiotics, and uh, thanks to this media which is pumped continuously, we can simulate the PK of the antibiotics, right? So I give antibiotics, and as this is all the time moving and providing media, then the concentration of antibiotics will decrease, and it's like a simulation in the human body. You can see here photographs of the model. Here you have the vessel, and here you have the media. You can see that the uh, disks, that the biofilm surfaces are well integrated in the media, and here are these disks, which have been dyed with a uh, crystal violet that, as you, can, uh, as, as you know, this dyes very well the organic material, so in this case the biofilm, and you can see that the biofilm is growing in the exposed uh, surfaces of the disks. Right, so here are just one example of the experiment. Here in the y-axis you have the amount of bacteria, and in the x-axis you have the uh, time, so these are time kill curves, as always. And this is a pseudomonasaruginosa, which is cholestin susceptible, but it's uh, doripenem resistant. So you see uh, on, on, the, on the white spots you have the control experiment, and on the gray spots you have treatment with doripenem, and nothing happens. When we give cholestin, we have some decrease of the count of, um, of bacteria, followed by our growth, again, because of the amplification of uh, heteroresistance of population, and when we give uh, the combination of, of different concentrations of cholestin plus doripenem, we have some synergistic points and some additive points. So the bottom line of this experiment is that cholestin is active against the biofilm, but it needs a second drug. If it is a beta-lactam or whatever it is, it will increase the activity and it will probably recover the activity of this second uh, drug, even if there is some resistance. This is again the guinea pig model, and these are experiments with Escherichia coli. So again, this small piece is uh, set under the skin of the guinea pig, and it is inoculated by Escherichia coli. The uh, guinea pig receives some antibiotics during some days, and you recover how many bacteria you get. And you can see uh, different monotherapies, like cycling, gentamicin, cholestin, and fosfomycin. And you can see that monotherapies do not cure the guinea pigs. But combinations of cholestin plus ticycycline, cholestin plus gentamicin, or cholestin plus fosfomycin have significantly better results than monotherapies. So um, it seems to be good, the combination. Do we have some clinical experience? We have some clinical experience, which is uh, very limited. It is retrospective. This is a, a, a clinical experience in Barcelona with 34 patients uh, with bone and joint infections, many of them with uh, prostate infection or hardware-related infection by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And these patients, over a period of 10 years, were treated either with a monotherapy of cholestin or beralactam, and in the last period, they were treated with a combination of cholestin plus beralactam, and these beralactams were administered in continuous infusion in order to optimize the PKPD profile of beralactams. And the results were very good for the combination therapy. You can see that success rate was around 73%, whereas monotherapies were only 32%, and this was significant. And if you remember uh, the slide of ciprofloxacin, yes or not, you will remember that these results are comparable to those of ciprofloxacin. So we could have an alternative to ciprofloxacin resistant subpopulations. The median dose of cholestin that we use was around five, six million units, and of course we had renal toxicity, which is what happens whenever you use polymyxins, but all of the patients recovered from renal insufficiency when we withdraw the antibiotic. Um, I was saying that cholestin may be uh, combined with other antibiotics, like cycling and the beralactams. We have tried a lot with beralactams. When we talk about, about beralactams, we uh, don't know which one is better. We usually choose the beralactam according to their susceptibility. So if septacidine has a low MIC, we will choose septacidine. If meropenem has a low MIC, we will choose uh, meropenem because we believe that all beralactams are pretty much the same in the setting of biofilm infection. Is this true? We don't know. There's some indirect evidence suggesting that meropenem could have a better, um, a better performance in the serum biofilm. And I am showing you these preliminary results, which have, have not been published yet, but it, it is, again, a time kill cure with a reactor. So this is biofilm embed pseudomonas aeruginosa. And you can see here that it is both susceptible to uh, septalosan tabaxabactam and meropenem. And you can see that the difference between meropenem alone and septalosan tabaxabactam is quite important, both when it's monotherapy and when it's with the addition of cholestin. Both are ameliorated by the use of cholestin, so this is a reproduction of the results previously, but meropenem plus cholestin was a bit better. 
So at the moment, we don't know, but it could be that venopenin, because of reasons that we don't know, is a bit better than the other beta-lactams. So summarizing the cholestine uh, alternative, I think we can say that cholestine's PKPD alone um, remain a problem in the setting of implant-associated infections, and therefore there is need to combination. Cholestine may have some advantages in the biofilm setting, mainly because uh, it can recover the activity of the second drug, and because it has a unique and complementary target within the deeper layers of the biofilm. Uh, we have some preclinical and clinical evidence suggesting the benefits of cholestine-based regimes, but further investigation is needed. In this regard, uh, I, I'm just announcing that we are um, currently conducting this study, which is called Colbeta, Colbeta 17, and this is an, uh, a study on the efficacy, a prospective study on the efficacy of beta-lactams administered as continuing infusion plus cholestine for patients with bone and urine infection caused by ciprofloxacin resistant gram negative bacilli. So this is a clinical problem, and we are currently performing this study, which has been uh, conducted in 19 hospitals in Spain, just to be sure that all these preclinical studies and the clinical experience, which was retrospective, is true. And if it is true, then maybe we can set a clinical trial just comparing different regimes, including this combination. Uh, the primary endpoint of the study that we are conducting is the rate of success, but we have some secondary endpoints that you can see here, which is the success rate stratified by the type of one ion infection, by the presence of foreign materia, the safety of treatment, PKPD data, and some data on microbiolo uh, some microbiological data, especially regarding the susceptibility of antibiotics within the biofilm. This is what we will do. We will have a bone and infection, which will be operated, and then we will start uh, treatment with cholestine plus beta-lactam for a minimum of 21 days. It can be more, but the minimum is 21 days. Uh, and then after these 21 days, the medical doctors may uh, continue with whatever uh, antibiotics they feel it's better. We will get some plasma concentrations of, for both cholestine and uh, the beta-lactams when they are administered as continuous infusion, and we will follow the patients for at least 6, 12 months and uh, we want to get some data on the treatment success and some PKPD data just comparing the results of plasma concentrations and the data of microorganisms. Uh, we have recruited so far 20 patients. We're expecting to end the recruitment in September next year. Uh, so I hope, I'm looking forward to uh, have the results and uh, sharing, sharing them with you. So that's, that's what I wanted to say about polymixins and uh, just a few words on phosphomycin. Phosphomycin is an old antibiotic. We Spaniards are quite proud of phosphomycin because it's the only antimicrobial molecule that was uh, researched in our country. So it's the only antibiotic that we, we, um, we made up, let's say. Um, and, but there's no, no, no much experience for phosphomycin in the biofilm. There's an increasing interest for phosphomycin, mainly because of its uh, molecular characteristics. As I will discuss in a while, uh, phosphomycin has a very low molecular weight, and this means a good diffusion, uh, both in the bone and both in the, um, in the biofilm. Um, phosphomycin is bactericidal, so it's uh, promising, and it has no cross resistance with other families of antibiotics because phosphomycin belongs to a unique family of antibiotics. Uh, the mechanism of action is similar, it's different, but the end is similar to cholestine. It permeabilizes the, the bacterial, uh, the cell wall, so it may increase the uptake of the second molecule and increase uh, the performance of the second molecule. So you, you know that phosphomycin is very well known because of its oral administration for urinary tract infections, but we are not talking about this. We are mainly talking about phosphomycin disodium, which is the intravenous presentation for, 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 for phosphomycin, <laughs> and um, which can get uh, high concentrations of uh, the antibiotic around 300 milligrams per liter. And so the resistance breakpoints are around 30 to 60 milligrams per liter. As I was saying, it has a very low molecular weight, so the volume of distribution is very, very high, and its uh, penetration into biofilm and into bone are very, very high, uh, around 20%, which is not bad comparing with other antibiotics. Uh, the penetration in biofilm is very, very good, and this is a comparison of phosphomycin with cyprofloxacin, which seem to be better when talking about um, diffusion within the biofilm, and much better than cotrimoxazole, that again seems to perform badly in the biofilm. What is good at, about phosphomycin is that it still keeps a very good activity in front of uh, gram negative. So um, this was mentioned in, in some uh, seasons during this uh, congresso. Uh, and as you can see here, phosphomycin uh, remains active against uh, Enterobacteriaceae, E. coli, and Klebsiella, even if they are ESBL producers. And you can see here this uh, pooled analysis published by Palagas, where uh, almost 97% of E. coli ESBL producers were susceptible and more than 80% of uh, ESBL producers, Klebsiella, were susceptible. Uh, 
this has remained stable uh, during the last years, and you, ha you have seen a resume of uh, different reports in different places of the world in different years on the susceptibility of azomycin uh, to enterobacteriaceae and other uh, gram negatives, and you can see that normally it's uh, around 90%. There are some exceptions, but it's, uh, it keeps activity, so it's probably active against the majority of gram negative. Regarding pseudomonas, we have a very heterogeneous report. So overall, it seems that pseudomonas is resistant to 70% of the cases, but it can be susceptible in one out of three, and it's largely dependent on the local epidemiology. So in this study, which is also a pooled study of previous studies, what they noticed is that um, pseudomonas was susceptible in more than 90% of the strains in uh, almost half of the studies. So there's a big heterogeneity on the susceptibility of phosphomycin to pseudomona. So you, you have to check in your center whether you can use it or not for pseudomonas aeruginosa. One big problem of phosphomycin, as you know, is that uh, its um, mutant frequency is very high, and so the likelihood of develop uh, resistance uh, in the treatment of a, uh, in, in, in a treatment of a serious infection is quite high, and therefore we have to give phosphomycin in combination as it happened with uh, cholestine. You can see here, here that the mutant prevention concentration of, of uh, phosphomycin is quite low, 60 to 100 milligrams per liter, and we are saying that the average concentration that I can get to phosphomycin is 300 milligrams per liter, so it is not that far one from the other, especially in places where phosphomycin can have more difficulties to, to arrive. No? We were saying that phosphomycin diffuses to bone around 20%, so we can be around that, that cipher. So we have to give phosphomycin in combination. I was talking about the um, mechanism of action of phosphomycin. Phosphomycin inhibits the phosphophenol pyruvate transferase, which gets uh, this molecule, which is very, very important for the cell wall peptidoglycane. And so the cell wall of the bacteria uh, cannot develop normally, and this is in a step previous to perlactams or glycopeptides. So phosphomycin interferes the formation of the cell wall and probably increases the permeability of the bacteria for a second drug. In this regard, I show you a slide which is very similar to the one of cholestine. This is, again, a hollow fiber model. We are talking here about planktonic bacteria, and uh, this is um, an E. coli which is susceptible to both meropenin and phosphomycin. And you can see here that when we administer phosphomycin, we have an initial downfall of um, the quantity of bacteria that we have, followed by a regrowth, which is explained by the amplification of a sub, uh, resistant subpopulation. So phosphomycin alone becomes resistant and finally leads to treatment failure. Um, we can see that meropenin performs very well because it is a susceptible strain, and when we administer meropenin plus phosphomycin, it's synergistic and we don't see a regrowth. So this combination is very, very good in the hollow fiber planktonic bacteria. What about um, biofilm? This is another type of reactor, but at the end of the day, it performs very similar to the reactor I was showing you. So this is biofilm embed bacteria, and this is Acetomonas aeruginosa uh, treated either with phosphomycin, with quinolones, or with phosphomycin and quinolones. You can see that after 48 hours of monotherapies with either phosphomycin or quinolones, we have no decrease in the count of, bi of biofilm embed bacteria, whereas the combination of phosphomycin and um, quinolones is very, very good for this bacteria. So the combination of phosphomycin seems to be working whenever we have susceptibility to these uh, antibiotics. Why is phosphomycin so important? Again, I am showing you the scheme of uh, the draft of a biofilm. We have superficial layers, we have deeper layers, and as it was the case of polymyxins, phosphomycin seems to be active against the deeper layers. This seems to be explained because of the uptake of phosphomycin, which is dependent on these uh, two uh, uptakes in the membrane of the bacteria, and these two uptakes are increased in the setting of anaerobiosis, as we may have in the deeper layers of the biofilm. So, as it happened with the polymyxins, uh, phosphomycin are complementary to the second drug. They have a unique target within the upper layers of the biofilm. Here I bring up again the experience with the guinea pig model, this time not for cholestine, but for phosphomycin. I repeat, uh, monotherapies have a very bad performance in the setting of biofilm uh, um, associated infections, but combinations of phosphomycin plus cholestine, plus entamycin, and plus tigestecline have a better performance than monotherapies. So again, we have in vivo experience about the usefulness of phosphomycin-based combinations. This happens for gram natives, but we also have experience in gram positives. This is uh, very similar to the guinea pig model. This is with a rat instead of a guinea, and you can see here the percentage of cure. You can see here the monotherapies with phosphomycin, daptomycin, rifampin, and you can see here the combinations of phosphomycin with other antibiotics, in this case, daptomycin or rifampin. This is for gram positives, and you can see that the performance of the combinations is much better than the performance of the monotherapies, and you can have a reasonably high percentage of cure. 
So concluding, I think that we can say that the role of gram-negative bacilli may be significant in bone and joint infections. Uh, there's an increase of prosthetic joint infection and other hardware-related infections caused by gram-negative in general and multidrug resistant gram-negative in particular. The use of phosphomycin and or cholestine or other polymyxins in the biofilm setting still needs the combination with a second antimicrobial. This antimicrobial may increase the bacterial wall permeability and so the performance of the second drug. And both drugs have activity against bacteria located within the deeper layer of the biofilm, which is quite valuable. There is preclinical evidence supporting the use of both drugs, and we have clinical evidence supporting the use of cholestine-based regimes. Still, we urgently need more clinical studies. Muito obrigado.